Good day and welcome to Epstein Becker Green's final OSHA webinar of 2014, OSHA forecast developments to watch in 2015 and beyond. We are pleased to have with us today Epstein Becker Green's Valerie Batera. Valerie is a member of the Labor and Employment Practice in the Washington, D.C. office. She represents clients from numerous industries, including healthcare and life sciences, financial services, hospitality, retail, and technology, among others. She is OSHA 30 certified and has substantial training and experience in process safety management. Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on our website in approximately two to three business days. All registrants of today's webinar will be informed of the availability of the recording and presentation materials via email. Also note that participant phone lines will be in listen-only mode throughout the program. You are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx. At the end of the program, with time permitting, Valerie will address your questions. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to Valerie following the webinar, and her contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. Thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to participate. Please listen, observe, and enjoy today's presentation. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Valerie. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today as I talk to you about what I think Rose is going to be focusing on in 2015 and beyond. First, we're going to talk about enforcement trends, then some regulatory activities, and finally, the new hazard communication standard. Before I begin talking about what to expect from OSHA in 2015, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about its last fiscal year. OSHA's enforcement plan for 2015 is quite similar to the approach it has taken over the past year, so this information gives us something of a preview of what's to come. In 2014, OSHA intentionally conducted less inspections and targeted its enforcement efforts on industries that had experienced the greatest numbers of injuries and illnesses. This will continue in 2015. I expect the list, targeted, the list of targeted industries to be fairly consistent with the industries targeted this year, with a few additions to the list. This year, OSHA's targets included chemical facilities, refineries, healthcare facilities, work sites employed large numbers of temporary employees, and work sites where violence is more likely to occur. This is OSHA's top 10 most frequently cited standards for 2014 list. There's no real surprises here. This is pretty consistent with the top 10 most frequently cited standards over the past several years. Coming in first place is fall protection and construction. Then we have HAZCOM, scaffolding and construction, respiratory protection, powered industrial trucks, lockout and packout, ladders and construction, electrical wiring, machine guarding, and electrical systems design. Given recent enforcement trends and regulatory initiatives, it is likely that OSHA will target these industries in 2015, many of which have already received a great deal of scrutiny from OSHA. Refineries and chemical plants, OSHA has taken significant enforcement and regulatory actions regarding chemical plants and petrochemical refining. A national emphasis program on chemicals is ongoing, and there are a number of state and regional programs targeting petrochemicals and refining. In addition, OSHA is working to respond to an executive order that requires OSHA and several other agencies to take action to dramatically reduce the likelihood of catastrophes involving chemicals and petrochemicals. Next, hospitals and residential care facilities. OSHA has announced that these are areas of enhanced scrutiny for a number of reasons, including concerns regarding infectious diseases, ergonomics, and the potential for workplace violence. Grain handlers. There are several ongoing regional enforcement programs focusing on grain handlers, but the recent, recent D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals decision, which I'll discuss in more detail later, 
determined that combustible dust from grain dust, which has historically been regulated under the grain handling standard, is a quote unquote hazardous chemical regulated by the hazard communication standard. So in June of this year, when employers are required to come into compliance with most of the requirements of the HAZCOM standard, grain handlers will likely face increased inspections to ensure HAZCOM compliance. And finally, I think that retail will be a huge focus this year. Recently, we've seen a lot of activity from OSHA regarding retail, and I expect this to continue. In November, OSHA launched a major initiative targeted at retail employers, emphasizing that safety measures must be implemented to keep employees safe at events requiring crowd control like Black Friday. In addition, there's been regional enforcement programs focusing on both boutiques and big box stores. We've seen a number of highly publicized citations issued to big box retailers and targeted enforcement efforts at some small retailers, particularly where there's a threat of workplace violence, such as convenience stores. OSHA also added for the first time a host of retail establishments to the group of employers required to participate in its injury and illness record keeping program, which we will also talk more about later. So what happened to OSHA's focus on temporary workers? Back in July, OSHA issued a policy memo to its field offices outlining when a compliance officer visiting a work site should enlarge the inspection to include temporary agencies providing workers to the site. Generally, compliance officers were instructed that whenever a temporary worker was exposed to a violation, the compliance officer should determine whether the temp agency was aware of the hazard or could have known about them. As a result, OSHA inspections involving temporary employee agencies increased 322% in fiscal 2014, but only 15% of the inspections resulted in citations being issued to the temporary employment agencies. But don't be fooled by these numbers. OSHA has cited many host employers for alleged violations related to temporary, temporary workers but found no basis for issuing citations to the temporary staffing agencies involved. Host employers should consider the safety of all of their employers, employees, I should say. Make sure that in addition to protecting your own employees, you are complying with OSHA's policies and best practices for working with contractors and temporary employees. Training is particularly important here. Your temporary employees must be provided the same degree of safety training that you provide your own employees. That being said, the safest course of action is to treat your temporary employees just like your own employees in every capacity. They should receive the same personal protective equipment, hazard communication instruction, etc. Temporary employees must receive the same degree of protection as the host employer's employees. In the few instances where a staffing agency has been cited during these inspections, lack of training seems to be the most frequently alleged violation. OSHA's temporary worker initiative is slated to continue in 2015. You may be aware that big changes are coming to OSHA's reporting and record keeping requirements as of January 1, 2015. Beginning January 1, all employers must report to OSHA all work-related fatalities within eight hours. All employers will also be required to report to OSHA within 24 hours all work-related inpatient hospitalizations, amputations, and loss of an eye. Employers have always been required to immediately report work-related fatalities and hospitalizations of three or more employees to OSHA but the new requirements regarding the immediate report of single hospitalizations, amputations, and loss of an eye will enable OSHA to quickly identify work sites for inspections that it might not have identified before. In the past, employers were, re were required to record such incidents, but not immediately required to report them to OSHA. The Occupational Safety and Health Act has a six-month statute of limitations, so under the old reporting requirements, an incident regarding, resulting in a single hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye, 
may not have led to a timely inspection of the incident that caused the injury, because OSHA may not have learned about the incident until after its statute of limitations for issuing citations had elapsed. The new reporting rules support OSHA's stated mission to focus its inspections on employers with the highest rates of injuries and illnesses, providing the agency with data in real time so that it can make more informed decisions about where to deploy its compliance officers. OSHA has added a large number of industries that have not previously been required to navigate the complexities of OSHA's injury and illness record keeping rules to its list of employers that now must keep such records. As I mentioned before, this includes retailers of all kinds, including automotive dealers, art supply stores, tobacco retailers, and more. Other major industries added to the list include ambulatory healthcare services, bakeries, and employers that rent out or lease equipment in, machi in machinery. Employers with 10 or fewer employees are usually exempt from the record keeping requirement regardless of what industry they're in. The only exception to this is in the instance where the Bureau of Labor and Statistics would send you a letter and specifically target you and inform you that you had to start keeping such records. But all employers, even those that are not required to record injuries and illnesses, are required to immediately report to OSHA job-related fatalities, inpatient hospitalization, amputation, and loss of an eye. It's not always easy to determine whether your business is even included among the industries required to keep records under the rule. Some industries, such as home health care agencies, for example, are required to keep records but this is by no means obvious from looking at OSHA's website. If you're unsure whether you must keep such records, you should consult with counsel for guidance. The record keeping rules themselves are also anything but easy to navigate. I could give an entire another webinar on that topic alone. In the meantime, again, if you are new to record keeping or have questions, you should contact counsel. and whistleblower claims are on the rise. New claims have dramatically increased in the vast majority of the 22 different whistleblower statute that OSHA, statutes that OSHA handles. Complaints of employer retaliation under the OSHA statute alone have risen 70% since 2005. But whistleblower investigators rarely find merit to these claims. Of the total number of claims determinations from 2005 to present, only 2% have been resolved on the merits. By comparison, during the same time period, 60% have been dismissed, while others have been withdrawn, kicked out, or resolved in some type of settlement. Complaints are expected to continuously rise nonetheless, as employees have become much more familiar with their rights under these various statutes containing whistleblower provisions. Particularly, particularly savvy complainants are filing complaints under multiple statutes simultaneously. Employers still need to be especially wary of the various whistleblower protections. OSHA has expended a great deal of resources and placed special emphasis on the whistleblower protection program. Accordingly, employers need to, at a minimum, have a disciplinary policy in effect, apply it consistently, keep excellent records of disciplinary actions and performance reviews and the like. In case you find yourself among the unlucky few whose cases proceed to inspections and decisions on the merits, successful whistleblower complaints have resulted in penalties in excess of $1 million. Now I wanna talk about OSHA's new enforcement strategy. OSHA has publicly announced that its plan for responding to emerging industries, new technologies, and changes in the American workforce consists of several strategic initiatives. Site-specific targeting, national and local emphasis programs, severe violator enforcement program, and corporate settlement agreement. And I can tell you from personal experience with my clients over this past year that this is very, very truly the tactics that OSHA is taking.
OSHA's site-specific targeting program is its primary programmed inspection plan for establishments with 20 or more employees. It does not apply to the construction industry, which is addressed separately, nor does it apply to nursing and personal care facilities, which are addressed by an ongoing national emphasis program. Targets are determined by a history of higher than average number of injuries and illnesses in the workplace, as determined by written injury and illness reporting required by OSHA. In determining its targets for 2014, OSHA reviewed information gathered from 70 industries as varied as department stores, farms, warehousing, and manufacturing. Where an employer has more than one work site, OSHA is likely to target multiple sites for inspection. Often, OSHA selects employers that give it the potential for more bang for its buck, that is, employers with more than one facility. If OSHA finds that even one work site among a group of work sites owned by the same employer has a high rate of injuries and illnesses, it is directed to compliance officers that inspections may be conducted at one or more of the employer's work sites. Often, the types of problems identified in an inspection of one facility are found at inspections of the employer's other work sites. OSHA can issue costly repeat citations to the employer by inspecting multiple facilities, finding similar issues throughout facilities, and issuing repeat citations at one facility based upon a similar citation having just been issued at another of the employer's facilities. Repeats create the potential that the employer will be added to OSHA's dreaded severe violator enforcement program, which we'll talk about more in a moment. So if you find yourself dealing with an OSHA inspection at one of your facilities, you should not be at all surprised if OSHA shows up to inspect your other facilities as well. If you have one or more facilities with high injury and illness rates, I recommend conducting an internal audit of those, audit of those facilities. This will help you spot trouble areas and address them, protecting your employees and helping you avoid running into any trouble with OSHA. But be careful in how you conduct your audit. Many compliance officers begin inspections and immediately ask for all of your audit reports, including your internal audit report. The compliance officers can then use your own audit reports against you, relying upon the results as a guide to possible OSHA violations in your facility. But if you work with counsel in arranging your internal audits, the resulting audit reports are protected under the attorney-client privilege. A couple of years ago, one of my clients hired a professional outside auditor to conduct an internal inspection of its facility so that it could identify areas for health and safety improvement. The client did not hire the auditor directly, however, but through counsel, as it was seeking OSHA compliance advice. When OSHA came to inspect the facility a year or so later, compliance officers came in and immediately asked for all of the audit reports, including the internal audit reports. We advised the client not to deliver the report to OSHA as it was protected by the attorney-client privilege. OSHA then sent a subpoena to the outside auditor seeking a copy of the report. The auditor thought this was suspicious and called us and moved to quash the subpoena. The administrative law judge refused to do so, so I petitioned for interlocutory review to, uh, of this issue to the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, and I'm glad I did. The commission granted the petition for review, adopted my client's position, and established new law that protects internal audit reports when created to help counsel advise, advise clients on OSHA compliance. So if you find yourself needing to conduct an internal audit of any of your facilities, I highly recommend that you do so with the aid of counsel in order to ensure that your audit reports are protected from disclosure to OSHA. OSHA also relies on a number of national and local emphasis programs which focus enforcement on certain industries. Currently, there are 13 national emphasis programs focusing on amputations, lead, silica, primary metals, ship breaking, trenching and excavation, process safety management of, cover, of covered chemical facilities, hexavalent chromium, federal agencies, combustible dust, isocyanate, refineries, and residential care facilities. 
In addition, there are currently approximately 140 regional or local emphasis programs. A few programs are in place in a number of regions, such as programs focusing on hazards in construction, grain handling, and oil refining. Although no additional inspections are to be scheduled under OSHA's National Refinery NEP, many local emphasis programs and state programs continue to conduct inspections and focus enforcement efforts in oil refineries. This brings us to the Severe Violator Enforcement Program. The Severe Violator Enforcement Program was established in 2010 and directs enforcement resources at employers who demonstrate indifference to OSH Act obligations by committing certain aggravated violations. The program subjects employers to enhanced enforcement measures and penalties for willful repeat and failure to abate violations in the following situations. When egregious citations are issued, issued, when a fatality or other catastrophe has occurred, when employees are expo exposed to a potential release of a highly hazardous chemical, when employees are exposed to the most dangerous occupational hazards and those identified as high emphasis hazards by OSHA, and these include falls, amputations, combustible dust incidents, and lead exposure and when at least three willful, repeat, or failure to abate citations are issued during an inspection based on potential releases of a highly hazardous chemical or any high emphasis hazard. So what happens if you're deemed a severe violator? If you have multiple work sites, OSHA is going to inspect most, if not all of them. You should expect frequent follow-up inspections. And perhaps worst of all, OSHA is going to engage in a public shaming campaign, issuing damning press releases and using social media to paint the employer as a bad actor and placing the employer on a publicly accessible list, which is extremely difficult to be removed from. Worse yet, employers are placed on this list before they've had the opportunity to demonstrate whether the citations that got them on the list in the first place are valid. A total of 423 employees populated the, the SBEP list this, at the end of OSHA's fiscal year, an increase of 23% over a year ago. Construction companies accounted for about 60% of the list, with manufacturer, manufacturers representing another 28%. About 55% of employers on the list have less than 10 employees, and only 14% are employers with more than 100 workers. Because of the tremendously negative impact of being included on the list, employers facing inclusion in the program are significantly more likely to contest citations than all other employers. Employers seek to have the citations that put them on the list withdrawn or dismissed, removing them from inclusion in the program. If the triggering citations are not withdrawn or dismissed, the employer must settle with OSHA and spend a minimum of three years in the program. And what that means as a practical matter is that OSHA is going to be visiting your work sites constantly and you are going to be hyper scrutinized. And finally, corporate settlement agreements, also known as CSAs. CSAs give OSHA the option of requiring employers to take actions at the work site where they receive citations plus all of their other work sites. CSAs are intended to give OSHA the flexibility to correct a pattern of non-compliance with various OSHA standards across multiple work sites. These agreements can be either national or regional in their scope. Although OSHA states that CSAs should be directed at areas of health and safety that have been subject of a citation, the agency will also consider going beyond the subject of the citations issued and include additional safety and health program enhancements. Some examples of program enhancements sought by OSHA in negotiating CSAs include corporate-wide injury and illness prevention programs, 
hiring a benefits expert consultant to assist in developing alternate safety-based provisions in its incentive and bonus programs, requiring uniform noise abatement procedures or ergonomics programs at all locations, requiring uniform personal protective equipment requirements at all locations, and hiring a third-party consultant to conduct periodic safety and health audits at the work site and make recommendations of how to mitigate the results, which the employer would be required to implement at all work sites. The types of cases that are targeted for CSAs include so-called high-profile enforcement cases. These are your, S your severe violator enforcement program cases, process safety management cases, cases involving fatalities or other catastrophes, significant reporting deficiency cases, and cases where high-gravity serious citations were issued. That is, cases where there was a high probability of death or serious harm to employees and at least one of the following circumstances is present. A pattern of violations associated with a particular OSHA standard or subpart, a significant history of OSHA violations, an accident or fatality trend stemming from the same or similar conditions. Employers should know that these agreements require abatement certifications and work sites that will be subject to extensive monitoring. If the terms of the agreement are violated by the employer, the employer can be prosecuted for failure to abate, resulting in additional significant fines. When employers enter into these agreements, they also forfeit their right to require OSHA to obtain a subpoena to access their documents or to come onto their work site, essentially giving OSHA warrantless search authority. Now turning to regulatory activities. On November 21st, 2014, the Department of Labor released its agency rule list, which provides the status of all rulemaking efforts at each of its agencies. OSHA dominated the list of regulatory activity in the department, listing 26 regulations in the pre-rule, proposed rule, and final rule stages. Of these 26 items, OSHA announced that its top regulatory priorities include silica. Workers are exposed to silica dust in general industry, construction, and maritime industries. Industries that could be particularly affected by a standard for silica include foundries, industries that have abrasive blasting operations, paint manufacture, glass and concrete product manufacture, brick making, China and pottery manufacturer, manufacturer of plumbing fixtures, and many construction activities, including highway repair, masonry, concrete work, rock drilling, and tuck pointing. Silica exposure can lead to a number of disabling illnesses and fatalities. OSHA has issued a notice of proposed rulemaking in 2013 and collected an extensive amount of data from chemical standard setting organizations and industry and trade groups. OSHA has stated that it would like to cut the permissible exposure for silica in half. That being said, given the amount of data that it must consider, it's too soon to tell when a final rule will be promulgated. Next is infectious disease protocols. Employees in healthcare and other high-risk environments face long-standing infectious disease hazards, such as tuberculosis, chickenpox, shingles, and measles, as well as new and emerging infectious disease threats such as Ebola, SARS, and pandemic influenza. Healthcare workers and workers in related occupations or who, or who are exposed in other high-risk environments are at increased risk of contracting infectious diseases that can be transmitted through a, a variety of exposure routes. OSHA is concerned about the ability of employees to continue to provide health care and other critical services without unreasonably jeopardizing their health. OSHA is therefore considering the need for a standard to ensure that employers establish a comprehensive infectious control program and control measures to protect employees from infectious disease exposures to pathogens that can cause significant disease. 
Workplaces where such control measures might be necessary include health care, emergency response, correctional facilities, homeless shelters, drug treatment programs, and other occupational settings where employees can be, increased, can be at increased risk of exposure to infectious people. A standard could also apply to laboratories, which handle materials that may be a source of pathogens, and to pathologists, coroners' offices, medical examiners, and mortuaries. The initiative is slated for review under the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act, or SABRIFA, by the end of this month. SABRIFA requires the panel to meet with representatives of directly regulated small businesses and offers them an opportunity to provide advice and recommendation on regulatory alternatives to minimize the burden on small entities. The next big focus is the electronic reporting of occupational injuries and illnesses. OSHA believes that the collection of worksite specific injury and illness data in electronic format on a timely basis is needed to help the agency, employers, employees, researchers, and the public more effectively prevent workplace injuries and illnesses as well as support President Obama's Open Government Initiative to increase the ability of the public to easily find, download, and use the resulting data set generated and held by the federal government. This rule has been extremely controversial with respect to the cost that employ employers must incur in instituting an electronic system and the fact that this information will be made publicly available. The notice of proposed rulemaking comment period recently ended, and OSHA aspires to finalize this rule by August 2015. Next up is whistleblowers. OSHA anticipates the publication of final rules either later this month and early next year regarding procedures for handling several of the uh, whistleblower complaints under several of the statutes that it is charged with handling. In addition, Late last week, OSHA Deputy Assistant Secretary Jordan Barb confirmed these regulatory initiatives as top priorities, but he added two more to the list of regulatory goals the agency hopes to accomplish during the remainder of the Obama administration. First is the extension of existing standards regarding work and confined spaces to construction-related activities. And second is the improvement of measures designed to prevent slips, trips, and falls on walking and working surfaces. There were some, also some other noteworthy regulatory actions that I wanted to talk about that I think are gonna have a pretty significant impact going forward. On October 10th, 2014, OSHA issued a request for information regarding its outdated permissible exposure limits, otherwise known as PELs, to certain chemicals found in the workplace. The vast majority of OSHA's PELs are more than 40 years old, and science has proven many of them to be insufficient to protect employees. Having tried unsuccessfully in the past to update the PELs with a few minor exceptions, what's interesting about the request for information, or RFI, is that the agency is not seeking recommendations for updated Pell values, but rather seeks information on better ways for the agency to regulate individual chemicals. OSHA has developed an RFI that seeks stakeholder input on a wide range of topics related to more effective strategies for better protecting workers from hazardous chemical exposures. Specifically, OSHA is seeking input about possible new approaches for streamlining risk assessment and, feasi and feasibility analyses, and alternative and additional new approaches for managing chemical exposures, including hazard banding, task-based approaches, and informed substitution. Stakeholders, including public health experts, chemical manufacturers, employers, unions, and others are encouraged submit comments in response to this RFA. The deadline is April 8, 2015. Given the potential for a radical change in OSHA's manner of regulating chemical exposure limits, stakeholders should take advantage of this opportunity to weigh in. OSHA also aspires to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking by the end of 2014. 
seeking to amend its record-keeping regulations to clarify that the duty to make and maintain accurate records of work-related injury, injuries and illnesses is an ongoing obligation. This proposal is clearly an attempt to circumvent a decision by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals in 2012 in which the court held that a plain reading of the six-month statute of limitations in the Occupational Safety and Health Act limits the period of time in which OSHA can issue a record-keeping citation to six months. Otherwise, the court reasoned, the Secretary of Labor could rely upon document retention rules contained within various OSHA standards to tack on extra time to the statute of limitations, potentially leading to absurd results and giving the Secretary the leeway to extend the statute of limitations forever simply by adding a never-ending document retention requirement to any given record-keeping rule. Finally, in response to an executive order released on August 2, 2013, titled Improving Chemical Facility Safety and Security, OSHA issued a comprehensive request for information on December 9, 2013. The comment period ended March 31, 2014. Many of the comments OSHA received related to modernization of the process safety management standard and related standards necessary to meet the goal of preventing major chemical accidents. OSHA intends to initiate the in June of 2015. However, OSHA Chief Dr. David Michaels announced in a hearing before several Senate committees last week that finalizing the changes needed to improve the PSM standard could easily take five years or more. OSHA was criticized for this timeline, which does not at all comport with the urgency required by the executive order. Whether this will have any effect on the timeline for making the changes remains to be seen. But what is certain is that the magnitude of the changes proposed to the PSM standard would, if adopted, create a sea change in OSHA's regulation of hazardous chemicals. We will closely monitor this topic as it moves forward and keep you informed of any new developments. There are also a couple of places where it was interesting that OSHA decided not to take action. First was combustible dust. Both the proposed standalone combustible dust standard and updates that OSHA had heretofore promised would be made constantly to the hazard communication standard, which includes the undefined term combustible dust within the definition of hazardous chemical, have been added to the list um, of topics that are on OSHA's um, so-called long-term action list, which means that basically the regulated community can't know when, if ever, these issues are going to be dealt with. So they don't want to deal with com the combustible dust issue on its own. They don't want to deal with it in HAZCOM, and we don't know if and when they ever will, which means that regulated industry is going to have to wait for a clear and intelligible definition of the term going forward. Second was I2P2, the proposed requirement that employers adopt injury and, Ill, injury, injury and illness prevention programs. This has also been shelved for an indeterminate period of time. I want to turn now to the new hazard communication standard and what we might expect going forward. In 2012, OSHA dramatically changed the hazard communication or HAZCOM standard, which had not previously been changed since 1994, in order to align it with the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, also known as GHS, a project being carried out by the United Nations. The goal of the change is to provide a common and coherent approach to classifying chemicals and communicating hazard information on labels and safety data, data sheets, which currently vary among different countries and even among agencies within the same country. A transition period was built into the move from the 1994 version of the standard to the 2012 standard. During the transition, employers can comply with the 1994 version, the 2012 version, or both. As you can see here, 
With a couple of minor exceptions, employers must be in compliance with all aspects of the new HASCOM rule by June 1st of 2015. There were a number of pre-enforcement challenges to the 2012 changes to the HASCOM rule. Among them was a case brought by a coalition of grain handlers who objected to the inclusion of the undefined term, term combustible dust within the definition of hazardous chemical. Any substance falling into the category of hazardous chemical is subject to all of the requirements of the HASCOM rule. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals rejected the challenge to the rule, even though combustible dust is not defined, making it incredibly difficult for potentially regulated industries to determine whether the new version of the rule applies to them. There are countless definitions of combustible dust provided by OSHA and a variety of standard-setting organizations. No two are alike. Disturbingly, the court, in justifying the inclusion of this undefined term, pointed to a guidance memo issued to OSHA compliance officers in December of last year, which provided instructions on how to identify when a HAZCOM citation should be issued where possible combustible dust hazards are involved under the 2012 version of the HAZCOM rule. Although the court found the letter sufficient to enlighten regulated industries about the meaning of combustible dust within the rule, the letter is, to most, incomprehensible and seems to imply that compliance officers should be enforcing the 2012 version of the rule now. Of course, the time for training has passed, so failure to training on the new HASCOM standard could potentially be cited at this point. But as I noted before, employers can choose not to comply with the remainder of the HAZ of HASCOM 2012 until June 1, 2015. The letter did, in fact, cause at least one compliance officer to understand that HASCOM citations for combustible dust standards under HASCOM 2012 should be issued now, even though employers are not yet required to comply. Citations were issued to an employer for alleged labeling deficiencies under HASCOM 2012. The citations were deleted when this error was brought to OSHA's attention, but the threat of confusion and wrongly issued citations remains. So now the regulated community does not know what combustible dust is for the purposes of the new HASCOM standard and is at risk of being cited even though the standard does not yet apply. Employers receiving HASCOM citations before the June 1, 2015 deadline should pay extremely close attention to the citation and please consult with counsel to determine whether it was appropriately issued and how best to handle the situation. Once June 1st hits, employers must be in compliance with pretty much all of the 2012 HASCOM standards. There appears to be no clarification in sight regarding combustible dust, as OSHA has stalled all of its regulatory efforts on that issue. It's critical that employers take action now, if they have not done so already, to move towards full compliance with the new version of the rule. Employers should anticipate that compliance officers will carefully study training records, safety data sheets, labeling, et cetera, and they should anticipate citations, particularly as OSHA compliance officers have not necessarily received clear guidance on every element of the new rules. Epstein Becker Green releases numerous communications as a means to keep you informed. And here are several examples. If you're not receiving our e-communications and would like to receive future issues, please contact our office. Our award-winning OSHA Law Update blog is available to you just by typing www.oshalawupdate.com. Be sure to subscribe to the blog today to receive timely updates concerning all facets of OSHA. Reach out if there's a topic you want to learn about, and we're happy to either send you a blog we have already written, or we will write one on the topic for you. Okay, and now it looks like we have a little bit of time to answer some questions, and it looks like we have a few. Um, okay, so first, under the new record-keeping requirements, 
Do I have to report an employee's fatality, inpatient hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye if it results from an automobile accident or a public street or highway? OSHA has provided guidance on this, um, and it's sort of strange. I'm not entirely sure what the thinking was here, but um, here's the deal. If the automobile accident occurred in a construction work zone, then you must report the fatality, inpatient hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye to OSHA in the time periods we talked about earlier. If the accident occurred on a public street or highway, but not in a construction work zone, then you do not have to report the fatality, inpatient hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye to OSHA. But you must keep um, records of the event in your OSHA injury and illness records if you're required to keep such records. Next is, what do I do if I don't learn, and this is again under the reporting requirements, what if I don't learn of a reportable event right away or cannot determine if it was a reportable event right away? The key here is when the incident is reported to the employer or one of its agents and when the employer determines that the event was a work was work related. The clock starts ticking on reporting the event to OSHA at that time. Notably, under any circumstances, you need to report heart attacks that may or may not have been related to your employer's, your employee's work. Those must be reported to OSHA and OSHA will make the determination of whether they should be inspected. Next is a HAZCOM question. Uh, without one clear definition for combustible dust, how do I determine whether dust created at my work site is subject to the new HAZCOM rule? This is kind of complicated, but I'll try to simplify it a little bit. Um, if you're aware that the type of dust created at your work site has ever resulted in a combustible dust incident somewhere, anywhere, it doesn't have to be at your site, you should just consider it combustible and treat it that way. Um, also, where there, there has been testing uh, on the product, the dust should be classified in accordance with whatever the results of those tests are. If there has not been any actual events with the dust that is produced in your facility um, and there's no test data on the product, the employer can also rely on published test data of similar materials or can refer to one of the combustible dust definitions provided by the various standard setting organizations such as NFPA um, and use any av available information about particle size to determine the combustible dust hazard of the product. It's important to note, however, that employers are not required to do their own testing to determine combustibility. Um, you, you basically are supposed to do your best to cobble together a determination based on what's already out there. Um, the next question is also reporting. Um, under the new reporting rule, what if the fatality, hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye does not occur immediately during or after work? If a fatality takes place that you determine resulted from a work incident, within 30 days after the incident, you must report it. When it comes to amputations, loss of an eye, and inpatient hospitalizations, those must be reported if they present within 24 hours of the workplace incident. Otherwise, you need not report the incident to OSHA immediately, but you must, you must record it if you're required to keep injury and illness logs. Valerie, we have also um, some other questions that have come through. Um, one is related to the infectious disease protocol. Has OSHA provided examples or specifics? Um, for instance, the HASCOM GHS questions, has NFPA and OSHA agreed on labeling requirements? No. Um, there's actually, uh, there's an OSHA task force on infectious diseases and that much progress has not been made yet. Um, following the website, um, you can get sort of an idea of where they're, they're trying to make progress and they're trying to move as quickly as possible through this because they understand, especially with, um, with situations like Ebola, that employees become um, quite upset quite quickly. So OSHA is doing its best to bear, you know, move through all of these things and determine what's the right equipment and what are the right protocols 
but obviously it's an incredibly complicated issue, so it's taking a little bit of time. Also, just as a, as a general state of you know, state of affairs, OSHA is pretty understaffed most of the time. So it's very difficult for them to respond to things very, very quickly, but they're beginning to slowly roll things out on their website, and I will be sure to include anything new on that topic in the blog. Great, thank you, Valerie. We have another question that came through. Um, there is currently a nationwide voluntary inspection program for ag, chemical, and fertilizer retailers called Responsible Ag. Are you familiar with this program? And if so, do you believe that uh, reports derived from these audits will be discoverable, discoverable by OSHA? I'm aware of the program. I'm not intimately involved with it, um, but I, I'm aware of the general parameters. That's tricky. I, I could see OSHA being able to get their hands on that, actually. Um, that would be something that would be a bit of a concern for me because, I, I, you know, again, it's the employer trying to do the right thing, so you would think that OSHA would leave that alone. And, and generally speaking, you know, no matter how, we, uh, how employers all feel or even I, I may feel, um, Compliance officers are good people. They're trying to do a good job, and they're not going to go after things like this where you're you're making a concerted effort to improve safety. But that still doesn't eliminate the possibility. Um, so there's no way I can say for sure that since that's you know those obviously aren't protected under the attorney-client privilege, it is technically possible that that OSHA could request that or could subpoena that. Okay. Thank you. Under the new HASCOM rule, is a company that purchases fuels, um, stores it in a tank, and then uh, delivers it to a farmer required to use the new labeling on the storage tanks and provide a new SDS to the farmer? My understanding of that is yes. Um, that was a work in progress. Uh, I actually had a, had a client who was faced with this exact, pretty much this exact situation, and we were told that by OSHA, um, by the people who were involved in the GHS and the whole nine yards, um, we were advised by OSHA that the safest tact was to, yes, um, comply with the labeling requirement regardless. Um, you, it, Basically, OSHA expects employers to anticipate how things are going to be used downstream. Um, and from OSHA's point of view, they expect you to think, okay, I'm going to ship this, and the recipient employees need to know what the hazards are associated with what is in that storage tank. So to be safe, absolutely, I, I would recommend going ahead with the labeling. Great, thank you, Valerie. This concludes today's webinar, and thank you again for joining us. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, FCVEC Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and PowerPoint materials. FCVEC Green wishes you and your family a happy and safe holiday season. Thank you so much.